Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Well, we'll go ahead and let those that are teaching in primetime preteens, we'll let you guys go ahead and get a head start. We appreciate here once again all of our teachers. You know, we allow the children to go earlier. The, the primetime preteens are staying right here. Thank you very much. And so primetime preteens, guys, are you in for a treat Amen. today also? Praise God. Well, um, I don't really need to introduce, although I want to, I like to take the opportunity to brag on Pastor Steve and Connie every chance I get. You know, um, 20 years ago now, actually this July will be 21 years, we were a part of this church, we were assistant pastors, and the Lord told us to go to Raleigh, North Carolina and start a church, and we did that. And we were obedient for seven years to do what God called us to do there. And uh, then the Lord was, was dealing with us about coming back here to Roanoke uh, as senior pastors. And, you know, I fought that. I'll just be real honest with you. Didn't fight God, but I fought th those thoughts because I was like, you know, this is our baby. How in the world could you leave uh, a church that you had helped? Of course, the Lord did all the work. Please understand. But... Um, how could you leave a, a church that you had birthed and watched grow and, and watched God do so many tremendous and awesome things? And I remember telling the Lord because it, it became very apparent that that was the direction we were headed. And uh, I, I told the Lord, I said, you know, I am not even going to consider this unless you have somebody already in place to take over because... I'm not leaving this church without a pastor. I'm not going to do that. I've seen that happen, and it just causes way too much stuff. And so I said, Lord, if you really want us to go to Roanoke and, and, and become senior pastors there, which we're here, so you know the end of the story already, um, you're going to have to send someone to uh, uh, this church that can take over that we have confidence in. Well, Pastor Rob Sal in Christiansburg called me one day and said, hey, I've got somebody I think can help fill the pulpit while you're pastoring both churches because we did. We pastored both churches for from uh, February to May. And, um, and, and so I said, well, you know, so we met them uh, at a Red Lobster in uh, Hickory, North Carolina, and sat down with them, talking to them, just getting to know them a little bit. And he was going to come and, and just minister just a time or two in the pulpit. We left that meeting knowing that they were the next pastors. I mean, God just put that. Didn't know them. I had seen them at an ICFM meeting and kind of, you know, I knew them by name, but didn't really know them. And, and so he came and ministered in Raleigh that one Sunday. And I called the folks. I don't remember if it was that evening or Monday morning. So how did they do? And, um, and the people said, can we keep them? Don't we need an assistant? Don't we need somebody to help? I mean, you know, can't we just keep them? And, you know, God just did it. God knit their hearts with Pastor Stephen Connie. God knit our hearts with them. And now I can say, four, almost 14 years later, that we've been here for almost 14 years, may it be 14 years, uh, I think, right, 14? Anyway, um, <clears throat> yeah, 14's right. Uh, yeah, never mind. Um, and uh, 14 years later, these guys have had the church there in Raleigh, and it's done so much. I mean, it's just an awesome place. You have to go see it sometime. But the thing that I wanted to say about these two is after 14 years of being there, the church, their church is about three times the size of ours. And they're just, I mean, they are, as they say, a mover and shaker in the kingdom. And they've got ministers from all over everywhere wanting to know how they do what they do. And so I've just been real proud of them. But the thing that just blesses me is if we step foot in Raleigh, North Carolina, they treat us like the founding pastors, which we are, but they treat us so good. They honor us. They respect us. They have never said, you know, this is my place now. You need to go back to Roanoke where you belong. They've always just received us. And, you know, I could go down there next week and say, the Lord said I needed to speak, and he would say, it's yours. That's just the kind of people they are. And so when we talk about people of integrity, when we talk about people of honor, when we talk about people that love God, these two just really is the picture that I get. 
And so uh, Pastor Steve is now a part of our board of directors, and we'll be having that meeting tomorrow. And so uh, we've asked him to come and minister to us today. So would you stand? I will say this to set up what he's going to do. Uh, in the body of Christ today, there's this need to become culturally relevant. There's this need for us to, you know, step up to the plate, as it were, and understand a little bit more of how the world thinks. Because it's more than just me and, you know, my four and no more. We've got to get out there and touch some folks. And just about every church that's tried to make that shift from, uh, has watered down or compromised their message or their integrity in order to get it. I'm not saying everybody. But th these two are absolutely a couple who can make that shift, have made that shift. They are culturally relevant to their world, but they are also spirit-led and they are also word-based. And so I am just so honored to have Steve and Connie Corona here today. So would you, with me, give them a great big welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Bless you, sir. God bless you, sir. Love you. Amen. Thank you. Well, I'm excited to be here. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, this is going to be a great morning. I'm just so, so honored to, to be here to speak. I asked Connie if she wanted to say anything. She's, Connie is so fascinated by my ministry that she just wants to stand back there and watch me preach. Uh, wave at everybody, sweetheart. Isn't she adorable? Absolutely adorable. Uh, uh, again, I, and I want to thank pastors Eddie and Debbie Crabtree, the founding pastors of Living Word Family Church, where I pastor. Good night. Who could follow an introduction like that? I was, after a while, I was sitting there thinking, who is he talking about? I thought I was preaching today. Uh, <laughs> Man, thank you so much for all those kind words, and, and I want to honor Pastors Eddie and Debbie Crabtree, the pastors of this house, and the founding pastors of the house where I pastor, and uh, best pastors in the world. And, uh, you know, he, he talked about, Pastor Eddie talked about how, uh, uh, how we honor him when, uh, when he comes to town, and that's absolutely true. We, uh, I mean, no bones about it, we work very hard at honoring them, but also, they have been so easy to work with. I know Louise Brock and John Jacobs and several people, when they go around the world and people are talking about church transitions, they tell them, well, you need to know Eddie and Debbie Crabtree because of the transition that happened in Raleigh. Uh, there are a lot of horror stories about power struggles and things that happen. One pastor leaves, the next pastor comes, and everybody wants to call the other pastor and uh, all, all this stuff, and we never had any of that. It was just very, very smooth. And they always honored us when they came, and uh, uh, it, it's just been a great, great situation for us. And we have had, God, God has blessed us with, uh, uh, with a lot of growth and a lot of success in Raleigh. We praise uh, the name of Jesus for that, but uh, that is due in large part to, uh, a huge part of that is the foundation that the crab trees left us uh, to build on, a very firm foundation. We can just come in and start building. We didn't have to tear it down and start all over again. So, uh, so that, that was really great. Well, uh, hold up your Bible. Did you bring your Bible? If you're new, if you're new here, uh, this is your first Sunday, second Sunday, you didn't know to bring your Bible, it's okay. Don't feel intimidated. But the rest of us brought our Bibles, right? Hold up your Bible, make this confession after me. Say, I thank you, Father, thank you, Father that your word, your word has, the has the power to change my life. To change my life. Today, I give heed to it. I allow it to go into my ears, into my mind, and into my spirit. I'm a hearer of the word and a doer of the word. And I'll never be the same after today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Brendan Rodney, that was great worship this morning. Thank you. It really led us into the presence of the Lord. And... Uh, uh, very talented worship team, very talented mu musicians, and my hat's off to everybody, but I want to know who the bass player is. Where are you? He's in class, but he's great. I'm a, I'm a bass player, so I, huh? He, he, he's terrific. Well, there you, is that you right there? How old are you? That's all right. He didn't want to stay. It's okay. Come, he's saying, you got me up here. What do you want? 
How, how old is he? Good night. You're good. I, you know, because a, a lot of people don't realize that behind the scenes musicians could actually bring out the anointing. And, uh, man, he's good. Of course, everybody else is good. Today. He, didn't, he didn't mention me. You were all good. But I, I was just impressed by this guy. All right. Well, I want to ask you a question. I got a bag here from Dollar Tree. And I got a bag here from Nordstrom. All right. Who wants, you can have one or the other. Who wants what's in the Nordstrom bag? Who wants what's in the Dollar Tree bag? I'm not, I'm not even going to suggest how dumb that is. Some of you didn't want either one. Let's try this again. Everybody has to. Come on. Be serious. Who wants what's in the Nordstrom bag? Who wants what's in the Dollar Tree bag? Okay. Now, what I want to point out, there are people who wanted what's in the Dollar Tree bag. Okay. But I want you to know that four times more people wanted what was in the Nordstrom bag. Okay, so let's take a look. In the Dollar Tree bag, we have the Word of God. And in the Nordstrom bag, we have the same thing. Four, more, four times more people wanted this than this. The message is the same. The message was the same. It, wasn't, it was the exact same thing in both bags. The difference was the way it was packaged. And the way it was packaged determined who and how many wanted it. We live in a day and an age where the gospel, the real gospel, sometimes is being presented in a Dollar Tree bag rather than a Nordstrom bag. And it's not that there's anything wrong with the message, it's the way it's packaged. And while there are a certain number of people who want the gospel that's packaged in the Dollar Tree bag, there is a whole world of people out there that are not, uh, uh, they're not able to relate to that because what they're looking for is something that's packaged differently. Volunteering in the United States is up 25%. Volunteering in churches is down 30%. Which means there are people volunteering, but less and less are people finding their place in churches. They still want to be a part of an organization that does good in the community, which is not all that church is about, but they still want a part of something where they can give back, but more and more people are finding a place to do that apart from the local church because of the way that the volunteer opportunities are packaged. God spoke to me about six years ago. I was in my church sanctuary praying, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me very clearly and said, churches today that are trying to be culturally relevant and relate to the culture are not being spirit-led. And that resonated within me because Connie and I had just come back from a conference, a church growth conference, where they spent three days talking about technology and being cool and didn't mention prayer or the Holy Spirit one time. So I thought to myself, that's right. These churches out here trying to, trying to be cool and culturally relevant are not following the leading of the Spirit. And then after I got through gloating over that, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, churches that are trying to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit are not being culturally relevant. Ouch. Because that was me. And he said, I want you to find the balance. I want you to take the message of the Word of God, the message of the Gospel, don't water it down, don't water the gifts of the Spirit down, don't water the message of the Word of Faith down, water any of that down, but I want you to package it in a culturally relevant way. I had no idea how to do that. And so I began to, uh, and actually what was interesting was I had all kinds of people inside my congregation who uh, who could see that, understood it, and could help me do it. And so we began to, I didn't change any of the messages, I didn't change anything I was preaching, but we began to change the way we packaged our uh, 
the ministry. We didn't water down the gifts of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, the presence of the Spirit. But what we did do was package it in a way that people could receive it, and people began to come and receive it. I'd like for you to turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 9. The book of 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Being culturally relevant has nothing to do with wearing cool jeans and having a coffee bar in your church. <laughs> Being culturally relevant has to do with loving people, caring about people, and asking yourself, what do we do to reach them? In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10, uh, 19. 1 Corinthians 9, 19. You got it? All right. 1 Corinthians 9, 19 says... For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. And to the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law. Not being without law toward God, of course, but under uh, law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without the law. To the weak I became was weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake that I may be a partaker of it with you. So here Paul is saying that, yeah, there are a lot of different things that I could do, a lot of different preferences that I have, but what I have done is laid down my... Have you ever heard this scripture that says there is no greater love that any man has than, than to lay down his life? For his friend, lay hat down his life for someone else. Sometimes we think that means that I would stand in front of a speeding train for you to save your life. That's not what Jesus is talking about at all. He's talking about the life and the lifestyle and the type of life that we try to hold on to. Jesus says no one has greater love than to lay down your life and your idea of what, uh, what life should be like in order to win someone else. And this is what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying, I become whoever it is I need to become in order to win them to Christ. He says, I know that we're no longer under the law, but if it means that I can win some to Christ, I will act as though I'm under the law to get them. I know that I'm weak, but in Christ I am strong, but I will identify with other people's weaknesses if it means that I can win them to Christ. I love what he says in verse 22. He says, to the weak I become as weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, now watch this, that I might by all means... Save some. By all means. He's saying whatever means is at my disposal, I'm going to use it. And the church has rejected this for years. The church has rejected this. We've got this holy attitude. You know, and God is holy. God expects us to be holy. But oftentimes we, we think that holiness is in the trappings of what we have and what we possess and how we, how we dress up the place rather than realizing that holiness is on the inside. And so there, Paul said, I've become all things to all men that by any means possible, and we're not, when we're saying any means possible, we're not talking about sin, and we're not, talk, we're not talking about uh, weak character, anything like that, but we're talking about what means is available for us to reach people with the gospel. If you go with me to Acts chapter 17, in Acts chapter 17, uh, verse 16, Paul is at Athens, and Athens is a city that's given over to idols. Acts chapter 17, verse 16. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him. And some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, May we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. 
Now verse 22 then and 23 talks about how Paul relates to the idols that they have in their community. Now if it was most of, most of uh, us and, and me uh, and most of the Pentecostal preachers that I know, we would have stood up in the Areopagus and talked about the dangers and the uh, despicableness of idols and we would have screamed and ranted and raved. Paul does a really smart thing. Paul in verse 22 stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you're very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore the one whom you worship without knowing him I proclaim to you. That, that's the most culturally relevant passage in the Bible. Paul is saying, this idol that you've got out here to the unknown God, I know him. And Paul uses this idol in their culture to proclaim the gospel to them. And the church has, we've lost that. You know, we have, we have the church has, has uh, uh, we, we've gotten in our four walls. We've got the music that we're comfortable with. We've got everything that we're comfortable with. And so we want everybody to come in to our services and relate to what we're doing. And they don't have a clue what we're talking about. Thank God for the blood of the Lamb. But when we say the blood of the Lamb, they have no idea what we're talking about. Are you saying that you took a young sheep and you killed it? When the, when, there are so many things. When I, was in, when I was growing up in the Methodist church, we used to sing a song, and, we, and there was a passage in there that said, Here I raise mine Ebenezer. I still don't know what that is. <laughs> I have no idea what that is. But, but so much. See, back in the day that that was written, it was relevant to that culture. And what we've done is John Wesley was a master at relating to the culture of his day. And what we have done is uh, uh, we have begun to worship these things of the past rather than taking the spirit that John Wesley had and continuing to relate to the culture that we're in. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 14 in the Message Bible, it says Jesus became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. Matthew chapter 18. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 18. Pastor Eddie's in a series called Bad Religion. Matthew chapter 18 verse 10. Take heed that you, you do not despise one of these little ones. Matthew 18, 10. Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. But what do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine and go to the mountains seeking the one that is straying? And if he should find it, assuredly I say to you, he rejoices more over the sheep than over the ninety-nine that did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Bad religion is when we build a ministry of making the 99 comfortable rather than going after the one that was lost. Jesus used parables in his day to explain the gospel. And the parables that Jesus used in his day now do not relate to our culture. Don't get me wrong. It's the Word of God. If it's in here, it is the infallible Word of God. But so often the, the, uh, the parables that he gave, the reason that he gave the parables was because as soon as they left his lips, they understood exactly what he was saying. Now when we teach on the parables, we've got to explain them. Jesus didn't have to explain them. Everybody went, oh, I get it. Uh, in Matthew 5, 13... Jesus talks about the parable of the salt. And he says, you're the salt of the earth. Don't lose your saltiness. Because if you lose your saltiness, then you're not good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. 
they understood without any further, did you know this? there's no further explanation there? Because they understood in their culture that old salt, bad salt, salt that after it had lost its saltiness was thrown out in the path and they used it for gravel. And people walked on it. And we go, oh, now I get it. But back then they got it without any explanation. It would be like now saying um, that uh, it'd be like saying when you boot up your com computer, it performs an analysis of your system's capability while the hourglass is on your screen. And we all go, oh, I understand that. Did you know that in 50 years when people are, are preaching the gospel, they can't use that illustration? Because they won't be waiting for an hourglass on their screen to go away before they, before they can uh, go on and, and use their computer. And in order to use a, an example like that, you'd have to explain it. And what they're going to need to do in 50 years is use culturally relevant examples. Is this making sense yeah. to, to anybody? We study the cultures of other countries before we attempt to minister to them. We study the cultures. We study, Connie and I have, you know, your pastors have, have traveled extensively around the, the globe. Connie and I have have traveled some ourselves. And before we go into a country, we want to be careful not to offend somebody in that country. So there are certain things that you don't do. I, I've never been to Thailand. My daughter has been to, anybody in here been to Thailand? I have been told, my daughter says, that you don't leave the chopsticks sticking in the rice, that that's an insult. Is that correct? What American would know that? That's something we have to be told before we go because we don't want to insult anybody else in that culture. So we study other cultures before we go into them to minister, but it's astounding that we don't study our own. I have a clip that I would like to show you. Some of you have already seen this clip because you saw the television program. And I am not, I first of all want to say when you see this come up on the screen, I don't want you to think that this is an endorsement of this television program. It's not. But I want you to see the questions that our culture is asking and how they're asking them. We got that ready? Let's watch this. It happened once a week on Wisteria Lane, like clockwork. The faithful would emerge from their homes in their Sunday best, with their family Bibles and their rosary beads and they would head off to their various houses of worship, passing by a certain non-believer who had never taken an interest in their ritual. But on this day, Lynette Scavo, for the first time in her life, was struck by something. Something she would later think of as divine inspiration. We should go to church. What? Why? What did we do? That's just... We've been through a lot lately, and we have a lot to be thankful for. Don't you think we owe the big guy a little FaceTime? Fine, fine. We'll go to church. Next week. I'm serious. What's the rush? God will still be there next Sunday. The Pistons, on the other hand, they lose today. They're gone for good. So I'm clear. You can't be bothered with saving your eternal soul because the Pistons have no defense? Okay, look. You didn't grow up going to church. I did. My parents dragged me to St. Anthony's every Sunday. I've done my time. Well, I haven't. I have some questions I would like answered. And I don't know anything about God or Jesus. And our kids don't either. Well, you don't have to go to church to learn that stuff. Yeah. I know about Jesus. See? He's a guy who helps out Santa Claus. Get dressed, kids. We're going to church. Oh, Lynette, hi. You look pretty. What are you all dressed up for? Well, I decided I should go to church today. Yeah, Tom said the same thing. Anyway, since you're the most religious person I know, I was wondering if you would take us to your church. 
I would love that. We're, we're leaving right now. You can follow us. Great. Just give me a second to sell Tom on the idea. You know, he was raised Catholic. Oh, don't go Catholic. All that standing and kneeling and genuflecting. I go for worship, not a workout. Mm, not to mention the incense, which smells good at first, until you feel your breakfast coming back up. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll be right back. Oh, this is so exciting. I'm going to church. By the way, what am I now? Presbyterian. Right. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Oh, shoot. Did I miss Mass? Is it at nine? Yes, Gabrielle. Nine o'clock Mass is still at nine o'clock. Good to know. Uh, Father, can I talk to you? Of course. I've actually been expecting you to come by. Why? Well, I thought you might need some comforting after your husband's death. Oh, that. Yeah, I was a little blue. But the good news is I bounced back. Really? Okay, this may come as a little shock to you. But guess who's getting married again? And I was thinking... Maybe you could perform the ceremony. Is Tuesday good for you? Uh, Victor's only been dead two weeks. Yeah, I know. But I'm no good single. Honestly, I don't know how you do it. Well, who is this man? Did you just meet him? No, 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 no. It's Carlos. Carlos? I, I didn't know you two were even speaking. Oh, yeah. We bumped into each other a few months ago and we just fell in love all over again. A few months ago? But you were married six months ago. Boy, you were just determined to make this awkward, aren't you? Oh, Gabrielle. Okay, look, in the eyes of the church, Carlos and I were never divorced. Technically, the affair was with Victor. And God smoked him. So we're good. <laughs> All right, yes, I've been a bad Catholic. Enough with the guilt thing. Are you going to marry us or not? Uh, fine. As long as you promise to stay married to Carlos for the rest of your life. Absolutely. But if I don't, I promise you I will change religions. Thank you. This is the nourishment each soul requires to go from acorn to oak. And this is what should bring us peace in our hearts. The blessed knowledge that God's love for us is as sure as the sunlight and that it is always shining. We only need to see it. Amen? Amen? Now, if you'll take out your hymnals and turn to page 335. What are you doing? I've got a question about a sermon. What? No, put your hand down. It'll just take a sec. Lynette, please, we don't do that here. Uh, yes, can I help you? Hi. <clears throat> I'm Lynette Scavo. I'm a friend of Bree Hodge. And your sermon was lovely, especially the part about the trees. Thank you. But here's where you lost me. God's love is as sure as the sunlight. Yes, absolutely. There, you have your answer. Now well, sit. The reason I ask is there's a dumbass walks into a school and starts shooting children. So I'm thinking, God's love? Not so sure. Did she just say dumbass? Ah, the eternal question. Why do bad things happen to good people? What you have to remember is God gave us free will. Much of the evil in the world is brought on by man himself. Oh, Lord. Yes, Lynette. Okay, I give you that one. But what about the tornado that just happened? You can't blame man for that. Get the keys ready, we'll slip out the back. You bring up a big theological issue, one that deserves a lot more time to explore. Why don't you come to our Tuesday night Bible study? We can discuss it then. Well, sure. I'm easy, thanks. Hey, church buddy. Look what I got. Wow, you bought a Bible. Yeah, and I'm breaking her in tonight. Nothing like that new Bible smell. Oh, so you're <laughs> coming to Bible study. Yeah, and I hope the Reverend's ready, because 
Got about a zillion questions for him. Lynette, I, I realize you don't have much experience with churches, so this really isn't your fault. What is it my fault? Well, last Sunday, when you kept raising your hand, we don't really do that. The church isn't a place for questions, it's a place for answers. Yeah, but how do you get the answers if you don't ask the questions? Well, typically we sit there and let the preacher preach, and eventually our questions are answered, and no one is humiliated. I'm sorry. Did I embarrass you on Sunday? Well, it's just that in our church, people don't talk back to the minister. But what if I need to? What if that's the kind of church I'm looking for? Well, then maybe you should explore other options. I mean, if you really enjoy talking back to the pulpit, why don't you try that gospel church by the airport? Okay. Or, uh, the Unitarians. From what I hear, those folks are anything goes. <laughs> so is your uh, delightful neighbor coming, the one with all the questions? Delightful? <laughs> I thought she annoyed you. No, I found her refreshing. It's like I always say, church is not a place for answers. It's a place for questions. You don't say that. I've never heard you say that, not once. Yes, well, anyway, I want to thank you for taking the initiative. New members are crucial to the health of this church. I won't forget you brought them. Or these. You were the one who came to me. You sought me out. Yes. And you know why? Because out of all my friends, you're the one who had real faith. You had an actual relationship with God. At least, that's what I thought. Because I have had a rough few months. <laughs> okay? But I know you've had rough times, too, and I always assumed that your faith had helped you get through them. I envied you that, to be honest. It did. It did help me. Really? Okay. How? It just did. Well, that's not a good answer. I have been through cancer and a tornado, and I don't know why I survived, and so many other people didn't. I don't understand, and I need to. Lynette, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you ask? Oh, that's right. You don't like asking questions. That's uh, what our society is thinking about religion and church and God and I apologize I realize that was a little edgy but the church has to wake up and realize that people in the world are asking questions and they want to know about God and who has the answers we do but oftentimes we don't put ourselves in a position to provide those answers for them. Bad religion is when we build a ministry of making the 99 comfortable rather than going after the one. So, y'all okay? Yeah. Okay, I thought you were in shock. I was. The first time I saw that, I was in shock myself. So, How to share God's passion for the culture. I want you to write these down. I've got seven, seven things that I want to share with you. Uh, uh, really quickly, in uh, how to share God's passion for the culture. God loves the, the lost. God loved the lost so much that He sent His only Son, that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. How to share God's passion for the culture. You ready? I'll wait another second. How to share God's passion for the culture. Are you ready? All right, number one, learn your pastor's heart for reaching others. Pastors Eddie and Debbie Crabtree have a heart for reaching people, reaching the lost. And we need to catch that heart from them. You need to listen to them. It's okay to ask them questions. But, but as you listen, uh, just sitting here as he ministers the word, you can catch his heart. You can catch her heart. You can know what's in there that God has placed in there for reaching people. Catch that. You don't have to, you don't have to be real concerned about whether or not, I've had people 
get real concerned about whether or not they had a vision, they had a purpose, they had a heart for the lost. What we need to do is catch our pastor's vision, our pastor's purpose, and our pastor's heart for the lost, and that la then let that be ours. Amen. Amen? Number two, celebrate, embrace, and become a part of reaching this culture with the gospel. And what that really boils down to is loving people. How much do we love people? That's the great thing I love about coming to Valley Word. It's contagious. It's obvious that you love people. Amen. We got to not only love people when, we, when they come here, but we've got to love people who are out there. Amen. Number three, think generationally. Uh, not only the bass player, but the conga player here. How old is he? See, I just think that's the coolest thing in the world. You know, and we've got to think generation, generationally. The youth of today are not the church of tomorrow. The youth of today are the church of today. And we have to embrace them. We have to welcome them. I'm not talking about tolerating sin, rebellion, bad attitudes. I'm not talking about that. But what I am saying is there's so much about the youth culture that we can embrace even though it doesn't fit into. Uh, that's something we had to do at, at Living Word. A lot of our youth culture did not fit into my religious box. It wasn't sin. It wasn't rebellion. It wasn't bad attitude. It wasn't wrong. It was that I, I didn't like it. And so in order to embrace another generation, how many of you can remember that your parents did not like your culture when you were a teenager? Anybody here remember that? And it's, it's always that way. And, and what's great about the church today is we're beginning to wake up and be able to tell the difference between what's, uh, what's culture and what's, a, what's actually wrong. Don't get, don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about tolerating sin. But what I am talking about is embracing a culture that is desperately trying to express themselves. Number three. That was number three. Number four. Realize that church is not always about us and what we like. Mm. Realize that church is not always about us and what we like. I am a classically trained musician. And I studied at the University of Tennessee to be a symphony conductor. And I love classical music. And if we had the kind of music in our church that I like, <laughs> but guess what? It's not about me. It's about reaching a culture of people. Jesus said there's no greater love for the culture than to lay down our lives for others. So we've got to study the culture, explore the culture, ask ourselves what question is the culture asking, and then we've got to answer those questions in a way that they can listen to them. And this applies to either side because there are, there are um, people that don't like change. I don't like change. I, I like, can't we just, can't, this works, why mess with it? Is, is, is what I like. But then there are people who, who just love change and they don't care if you change all the time. And so sometimes when you're talking about being culturally relevant and reaching a culture, there are people that are a little bit resistant to that who don't like change. We've got to realize that church is not about us. Church is about uh, growing in Christ and then getting ourselves mature enough that then uh, we realize that our kingdom purpose is not to be comfortable for the rest of our life. Our kingdom purpose is to reach others with the gospel. Invite others. Bring others. How many people have you invited to church in the last two months? You're either in growth mode, you're a new Christian or a recommitted Christian, and you're growing yourself to the point where you can reach others, or you are a mature Christian and now you, re you realize that your life, the purpose of your life, is to reach other people. It's not to be comfortable. And so, but then there are those who like change and when, uh, 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 
when we show a clip from Desperate Housewives, when, when the pastor shows up on the platform with jeans on, we go, oh, cool, I like that. You've got to realize it's not about, that's still not about you. It's about reaching others. Number five, be prepared for an influx of new people. I have been to churches who don't like new people. Seriously, you've been to that church? I know it's not this church. You've been to that church? It doesn't like new people because new people don't look like us. They don't act like us. They don't think like us. They don't talk like us. Some of them don't smell like us. New, new, people are, new people are different. We've pretty much got everybody that's going to come who's like us. We've pretty much got those. And now new people, an influx of new people means that new people are different. And we have to embrace them. We have to love them. And we have to make a place for them. Number six, welcome change. Everything that grows changes. Aren't you glad that your feet are not the same size that they were when you were five? Because they could not hold you up. Aren't you glad that your hands are not the same size as they were when they were three? Everything that grows changes. And so in order for church to grow, church has to change. The seven last words of any dying church are... We never did it that way before. Number seven, take risks. All worthwhile endeavors are risky at first. If you've gotten a statement back, uh, when you get your statements from the investments that you make, how I many of you know that if your money is going to grow, if your investments are going to do well, you have to take a risk? And every single statement on every page of my investment uh, portfolio, every, every report that comes in has a statement at the bottom that says every investment has risks. Every business endeavor has risks. Every relationship you create has risks. Wow, that girl's cute. Maybe I'll ask her for a date. Do you realize that has risks? Every worthwhile endeavor has risks. And being a culturally relevant church is risky. But we got to take the risks. A young lady in our ministry named Kelsey. Kelsey, six years ago, uh, we had a team who would go to a theater downtown on Saturday night called the Rocky Horror Picture Show. That's what they would show every Saturday night. It was kind of a cult thing. All the, uh, all the goths, all the, all the, you know, all the strange people, the weird people would go there to all be weird together. And we had a team. We had a team of people that would go down there and share the gospel and, and witness to people. And uh, um, Kelsey came out. Kelsey was all dressed in black. And Kelsey had, I've never seen anybody with more rings in their face. That was amazing. Her whole face was covered with rings. She has tattoos, tattoos on her chest. She has tattoos in places I don't want to know about. She, she, uh, she came to Living Word and uh, dressed like that. I'm not encouraging our young people to do that. In fact, we discourage it. But we were relevant enough that she was able to come and find a place. I know, and I know there are people sitting here thinking, dear God, I hope she doesn't come here. <laughs> um, but Kelsey committed her life to Christ. Um, I believe it was one Sunday. It wasn't during the service, but it was after a service. Somebody talked to her. She committed her life to Christ. Uh, and, and, this, this is equally as important for her survival. She committed her life to us. For us to be able to speak into her life, to help her, to minister to her, now, today, Kelsey is on staff at Living Word. She's a secretary to three pastors. 
She just celebrated. She just got her, uh, she's in Celebrate Recovery, and she just celebrated six years of sobriety and got her six-year sobriety pin. She's on our outreach team. She's been on three mission trips. She just two months ago started on our worship team. But it's creating... So what we're talking about is, when we're talking about culturally re- being culturally relevant, we're talking about reaching people. We're not talking about how cool can we be? What cool things can we do? And there, and there are different cultures. When we're talking about being culturally relevant, you've got to ask yourself, so what culture are you talking about? Because there's more than, we're a multicultural society now in the United States. Very multicultural. And so when we're talking about culture, these are questions that have to be asked, and uh, the answers to those are in the heart of your pastors as they lead this church and as they lead the charge. There are, I've told Kelsey's story other places to other pastors, to other leaders, and everybody thinks it's a great story, and everybody would like to have the same thing happen in their church, but not everybody is willing to pay the price to make a place. For Kelsey. I love Valley Word. I love coming here. This is a great church. You got you not only have great pastors, you got great people, you got great music. This is a great church. I love coming here and feel very, very welcome here. And my prayer for Valley Word is that God is able to use you to reach the people in the culture in the Roanoke Valley area who are asking questions. There are people, you have neighbors who are not at church today. And if we're not careful, we look down our nose at them and think, well, those heathens, they ought to go to church. But you know, they may be watching Christian television this morning. They may be going through the time of their... Economically, things are tough out there. They may be going through the time of their life. They may be the person who comes up to you, just like Lynette did. Walked right up to her neighbor on a Sunday morning and said, I want to go to church with you. And so when they come with you to church, what are they going to find? That's the question. And are they going to, are the life is here. The life of God is here. The question is, are they going to recognize it? And are they going to find it? Are they going to be able to receive it? I believe so. Do you? Will you stand with me? Would you make this confession with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for me, for my family, for my neighbors, for my friends, for everyone in the Roanoke Valley area. I thank you that you've called a church who can reach into our culture can reach into our community and that people can commit their lives to Christ. Heavenly Father, thank you that you use us to be able to reach people, touch people, touch our hearts so that we can grow and then we can touch others. We believe the Valley Word, this church on the move, has been called to touch the lives of people. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Now, with everybody's head bowed, please, every eye closed for just a moment. Need everyone's head bowed, every eye closed, please. I just want to give you an opportunity to commit your life to Jesus Christ today. I've talked about being culturally relevant, but a relationship with Jesus Christ does not start with being cool. A relationship with Jesus Christ begins when we make a decision to follow him. God loves you, and God has a plan for your life. Because of sin, all of us have been separated from God. Every person in this building was separated from God. But Jesus Christ came and paid the price for your sins with his death on the cross so that you could be free. You could be free to serve him. You could be free to fulfill your destiny on this earth, and that you could be free to spend eternity with him. Maybe you've never heard a presentation like this. Maybe you've never heard uh, the gospel explained like this. 
Maybe you used to serve God and you've fallen away from the Lord and you went into eternity today, you're not sure what would happen to you. Today, you can make things right with God. What you need to do is to make a decision to follow Jesus. And you can do that right there where you're standing. I want you to pray a prayer with me right there where you're standing, repenting for your sins, asking the Holy Spirit to come in and empower you to be the Christian that the Bible promises you that you can be. So while everybody's head's bowed, every eye's closed, nobody's looking around, this is between you and God. I want to pray for you right there where you're standing. And you can make this decision to follow Christ right now. So while everybody's head's bowed, eyes are closed, if you want to pray this prayer with me right there and you want to make a decision to follow Jesus, I want you to raise your hand real high and say, Pastor Steve, I want to pray that prayer with you this morning. I want to make a decision to follow Jesus Christ. Maybe you've never done this before. Maybe you've never even been to church before. And maybe you've never heard anything like this before. Maybe you've fallen away from God. Today is the day for you to come back. I want you to raise your hand real high where I can see it. And I'm going to pray a prayer of commitment with you right there where you're standing. I see your hand. Who else would raise your hand and say, I want to make a decision? I see your hand, ma'am. Who else? I see your hand. Who else? Several hands have gone up. Join them. Join there. Don't, don't leave here without a relationship with Jesus Christ. Don't leave here without making a decision to follow Jesus. I see your hand. Young lady, I see your hand as well. Who else? I want to make a decision to follow Jesus today. I see your hand, sir. Anyone else? Anyone else? I see your hand, sir. Who else? Anyone else? I want to make a decision to follow Jesus. Anyone else? You can put your hands down now. Everyone look up here. We've got people all over the building who have raised their hands this morning who want to make commitments to follow Jesus. Are you excited about that, church? Yeah. Amen. All right. Now what I'm going to do is pray a prayer with you right there where you are. And I want you, those of you that raised your hands, there were probably seven of you, eight of you, I want you to pray this and I want you to mean this like nothing you have ever prayed in your life. Your life is about to change forever right now. Those of us that are believers are going to pray this prayer with you because you're about to become our brothers and sisters in the Lord. All right, church, you ready to pray? Let's all say this together. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you sent your son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for me. Jesus, thank you that you willingly came and shed your blood on the cross to wash away all my sins. So I repent for my sins and I say, Jesus, you are the Lord of my life. Holy Spirit, come and live on the inside of me now. Empower me to be the Christian that the Bible promises me I can be. As I come to church, as I learn to pray, as I read my Bible, my life will never be the same after this moment. In Jesus' name, amen.